Are you guys ready to talk about sex and relationships? No. See, that's a funny question, right? Because everyone looks around and goes, if I'm too gung-ho for this, everyone's going to go like, what? Is Mark, what's up with that dude? <laughs> it's like, whoa. <laughs> but all of us know that all of you guys are like, yes, I, I'd love to talk about that. I just, I just, I, yeah, it's just embarrassing to say that I'm actually interested. It's not embarrassing. Hopefully after this, you'll be less embarrassed about all that kind of stuff. Because talk number one, in this four or possibly five part series <laughs> is called God's Great Design. All right. So, to start off, I have a little kind of beginning talk that this, me- it's about, I don't need, I'm not even going to say how long it is. Um, but it, it's meant to kind of cover the entire series. And it's kind of a basis for which we want to think about this stuff. First of all, What is relationships that honor God? What are you talking about? What is this thing about? All right. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, a personal history, I guess, in in regards to sex and relationships and when I was a teenager. Because believe it or not, there was a day when I was a junior high boy. Don't even think. (laughs) Because it was terrible. (laughs) You did not, yeah. Anyway, no, it wasn't. Junior high boys are awesome. Um... But I was a little bit wild. Okay, Uh, so here's my experience growing up. I had so many questions, but when I was growing up, it was, there was nowhere, at least I felt, there was nowhere for me to go to ask these questions. And so questions like, why does God want us to wait until marriage for sex? Like, I was just trying to figure that out. You know, I knew what the Bible said, and, you know, I'd heard stuff. Um, But I I just had these questions I just really wanted to ask in a personal setting. Why did God make it so hard to wait? So if he wants us to wait till marriage, why is it so difficult? Like, why are our bodies geared to say <laughs> yes? And, and God is saying, not yet, right? What? what? How does that work? Why, why, why is that? If I'm not supposed to have sex until I'm married, why does my body seem to disagree? Quite often, right? And this is some of the things that, at least for me, I was asking as a teenage boy. As a teenage girl, you may know I <laughs> may not have had those questions. They might be different. Um, but you had questions, and those are just some samples. There's hundreds of questions, right? These are just were my questions when I was a kid. Now, here's, here's I have this crazy memory. Um, now, imagine with me many, many years ago. I'm talking decades. <laughs> And I have no one to ask questions to. I don't feel anyone safe. Uh, I'm embarrassed about it. Changes in your body. You know, you're learning stuff at school. But I mean, how, what, what's going on? Uh, I need someone to, to help me out. And so there was this, okay, this is so lame. There was this uh, computer game that was called, I, forget, I think it was The Therapist or something. Okay, this is so, so lame, right? When I say a computer game, this is like old computer where, <laughs> where there's no color or nothing, right? And you just would type in your question and the therapist would ask you questions. But it was like, it was based under like counseling theory. And so it would ask you, it would ask you these questions. To, but it, you know, it, of course it doesn't have any answers. It's just the answers are supposed to be within you, right? And so it would, I'd be asking these questions. I'd be typing and looking around, make sure nobody's around. I'd ask a question. And then it would just kind of repeat the question in another form and ask me it. And I'd be like, well, what? I'm not going to change the question. <laughs> it just kept happening. It was so disappointing. I'm like, well, I don't know. That's why I'm asking you. <laughs> so it was fruitless. But it's funny because I just had that memory. I was like, oh, yeah. Uh, but I just, I had all these questions, and I didn't have anyone to ask. And here, here was the issue. Um, when I was growing up, it was the, there was silence from the church. Nobody taught about it. If they did, it was on a Sunday morning, and it was mentioned. Um, the questions that I was asking didn't seem, you know, none of the adults were asking, because, I mean, they already knew, <laughs> right? Um, and I just, where can I go to get answers? Even in youth group, like, we had some teaching on it, but basically... The feeling was sex, um, you know, it's, it's for marriage. Uh, just don't do it. And just no explanations, no kind of like God just doesn't want you to do it. Or even worse, 
where there's, you know, it's sinful, or you get this picture that it's dirty and gross, and it's just like, oh, and, you, and then, of course, you're embarrassed about it. And so then you really can't ask anyone questions, because now it's embarrassing and maybe dirty, and then you, well, am I dirty because I have these questions? And so that was, a, that was really difficult. Um, fast forward many years. Uh, I've, I've become a dad, and it's kind of weird because my kids are in here. <laughs> but uh, one, of the, one of the reasons that I developed this series is because I'm like, okay, and this was when my, my little girl, Naya, was <laughs> just tiny. Sorry, Naya. <laughs> She's just like, oh, great. Um, she did little, right? She's little, and I looked at her, and I'm like thinking ahead and dreaming of the future, and I'm like, what do I want my kids to know? What do I want my little girl to know? And then, you know, I have more kids, and of course, I, what, what do I want them to know? And so this series is kind of born out of that. What do I want my kids to know? Um, I made lots of mistakes. I, I, and I, because I didn't have, we didn't have, my wife and I, we didn't have anyone to ask. Like we're, you are know, trying to date and we're trying to do this stuff and, and it's just really kind of short answers and, um, you know, nobody really wants to, wanted to sit down and talk and, of course, we were embarrassed about it because we had this kind of feeling that it's all dirty and, and hidden and, um, you know, it's mysterious at the same time, so there's a big draw, right? And so uh, I'm like, you know what? I want my kids to know these things. I want it to be in the light. I want us to talk about it and uh, I want them to have a vision of sex that's biblical. So for me, that was huge. Now, this is, this is, ama- this is the, the really, really difficult part, is that the fight is so hard. It is our, our culture and all around us does not have the same view of sex as God does. So God's view of sex is increasingly viewed as immoral. Like, this is one of the things that is coming out from, from polls now, um, that the Christian view of sex is actually immoral, which is interesting because as a Christian, you know, we balance morality according to what God says, right? And so it's interesting that our culture has shifted so far uh, away from, from God's design that now it looks at God's design as immoral. Not, not all of culture, not everyone, but it's, there is this definite shift to push hard against this and go like, that's immoral. You can't have those types of beliefs. You're not allowed to believe that stuff. And then archaic. Archaic just means old and out of date, right? Well, that's just, you know, for the other generations, not us. Like, surely not us. We've progressed past that, right? Which is every generation has said that, including ours and yours. And then uh, intolerant. Intolerant. Now, that's another, another big one, right? And that's a huge sin of our culture. And that's, that's par- partially why they view it as immoral, because one of the big values of our, color, of our culture is tolerance. Of course, it's very hypocritical, because tolerance of certain things and not others. But anyway, that's for another time. Backward, closed-minded, unhealthy. I mean, I've heard this. It's unhealthy. It's actually harmful to have this type of belief system when it comes to sexuality. And the biggest one is, not the biggest one, but one of the big ones is it's a hindrance, hindrance to progress, right? Our culture is moving this way, and, you know, the Christian's view of things like sexuality, it's holding everyone back, and so we're kind of annoying and a hindrance. Okay, so that's, that's why the fight is difficult. Uh, at times, I've felt like our culture, especially in regards to sexuality, is like a freight train, that's just barreling down the tracks, and we have all these students just standing on the tracks, kind of looking around. <laughs> and it's, it's like, oh, I hate that image. Because, first of all, it's not true. It feels like that's what's happening. But our God is so much bigger than a little tiny train that's barreling down a track, <laughs> right? We're talking about God. He's so much bigger, so much better, so much more powerful. And so... Whenever I think like that, it's, it's a little bit depressing. I have to remember, uh-uh, look at the God that we serve. And so we've talked a lot about our enemies, um, the enemy, over the, this year a lot, starting with the kingdom back in uh, our series on the kingdom back in first semester, uh, going into um, identity stuff that we talked about. It's been this constant theme. Um, he's, 
he, he's pushing hard against the church, and this is one of the areas uh, that he's pushing hard against. He wants to destroy as much as possible. He wants to take what is God has said is good, and he wants everyone, including us, to think, oh, what was good is now bad. There's actually a, a scripture verse about this. <laughs> and then what was bad is now good. And you can see that shift. So here's what I want us to do. This is what this is kind of really centering on. To develop the habit of asking this question. How do I honor God with my life? This is such an important question. It's not just for, for sex. It's for everything in your life. We want to start thinking about what, how, what honors God. How can I glorify? It's another way of saying glorif- to, to bring glory to God. I want my life to bring glory to God. Does this glorify God? Does this give him honor? All right. So the basis of this entire talk, there's three things that I want us to kind of build on. The first is that we need to have a receptive heart. Our culture has, is pushes heart. It preaches in all sorts of ways through media, music, uh, school, whatever, education. It is pushing so hard a view of sexuality that is not God's design. And so we need to be, have, an, have a, a receptive heart. Are, we, are you willing to listen to what God says? Do you really want to know what God thinks and says about sexuality? Because, you know, spoiler alert, I guess, he created it. So here's, uh, here's the image I want to give you in, in regards to having a receptive heart. It comes from Isaiah chapter 30. Now the people of Israel have been in rebellion against God's design. They're pushing against it. They don't like it. They want out from under it. And so this is what they're saying to Isaiah the prophet. Go now. Oh, no, sorry. This is God speaking to Isaiah. Go now. Write it on a tablet for them. Inscribe it on a scroll. That for the days to come, it may be an everlasting witness. Okay, so this, if God is saying this, that's something really important. Like he, he said, this is not going to fade. Write it on something. That, and and the, the imagery is that it's something that will last forever. Of course, that's, we have it written in here still, like thousands of years later. For these, talking about the people of Israel, were, who were the people of God at the time, for these are rebellious people, deceitful children, Children unlis- <coughs> unwilling to listen to the Lord's instruction. They say to the seers, see no more visions. And to the prophets, give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us pleasant things. Prophesy illusions. So what they're saying is, tell us nice fluffy th- things that make us feel nice, feel good. <laughs> don't, don't kind of like, hold, hold on, we don't want to hear the hard stuff. We just, we want you to tell us that we're good and that everything is okay. So they're actually telling the prophet here, lie to us. We don't want to hear the truth. That's crazy. Leave this way. Get off this path, right? They're telling the prophet, stop doing this. Leave this way. Get off this path and stop path and stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel. Stop telling us the truth. Stop telling us about God and his design and his commands. Stop it. Tell us lies. That's what the people are asking. (laughs) Okay, so this is why we need to have a receptive heart. This isn't just those people. This is, this passage is in here and it's It's inscribed in stone, meaning it's going to last from generation to generation. There's something in us that really just wants to hear stuff that's going to make us feel better and feel good. And, you know, sometimes God's word (laughs) makes us feel awesome. But sometimes it bears its weight on us and it doesn't feel very good. But we want to have a receptive heart so we take the good stuff, the stuff that makes you go like, yeah, this is awesome, and the stuff that's going like, ooh, that's hard. We want to take it all with a receptive heart. Okay, so that's, uh, we need a receptive heart to hear this. Secondly, um, we need what I'm going to call a vital perspective. Now, this perspective thing is a way of looking at something, right? So, super important to understand. Jesus has come to give you life to the full. Now, we've used this verse so many times at youth. It's, it, 
for me, the believer needs to have this in your, your believer toolbox, <laughs> right? John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus, and this is Jesus speaking, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. The promise of God to live in his design is fullness of life, you guys. Now, this is where the doubts often creep in, that God is holding back, that somehow he's just restricting, uh, that he just wants to, us to kind of begrudgingly obey him. It's like, ah, oh, it sucks, but I have to. God's not happy with that. That's not what he's looking for because he's offering us fullness. See, that begrudging heart won't give you the fullness. There's something more that God is offering. Life to the full. And so that's a vital perspective that you need to have, a viewpoint of God's, of, of God's laws, his scripture, um, and the way he's designed life. And that is where lots of doubt creeps in. And then finally, the third thing we need to have is this critical understanding. Our purpose as believers is to glorify or honor, glorify God, and enjoy him forever. That's our purpose. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. So this is found in numerous places. I just kind of picked two. Um, Romans chapter 11, verse 36 says, For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his, what? Glory. Seriously? How much? Everything? Everything? All glory to him forever? Wow. It's intended for him, for his glory. Everything, all of creation is intended for his glory. Now, making it personal, we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. So whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, that pretty much covers everything, is it not? <laughs> do it for all for what? The glory of God. This is where we get this statement that our purpose is, as believers, is to glorify God. And the second part is enjoy him forever because when we glorify God with our lives, what's produced in us is what the fruit of the Spirit. One of the fruit of the Spirit is love. joy, love. Yes, that too. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Nicely done. Thank you, Matthew. Awesome. Yes. So that's what is produced in us. So when we're living in God's design and we're like, we're like, yes, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm chasing after you. I want, I want to live the way that you've designed life. The result is that we glorify God and we're filled with joy. That's awesome. Okay. So here's where I want to go with this talk today. God's great design. We're going to explore the beginnings of this whole design, and we're going to go through um, a little bit of Genesis today. And uh, in your small groups, you have some uh, stuff from, from the Apostle Paul that you get to talk about. But let's, this is where it all got started. So talk one, how did it get started? Genesis chapter 1, verse 24 to 28. So God has created... In, in, in the first five days, has created all this stuff. And then at the end, the sixth day, he creates man and woman. Then God said, Let the earth produce every sort of animal, each producing offspring of the same kind, livestock, small animals that scurry along the ground, and wild animals. And that is what happened. God made all sorts of wild animals, livestock, small animals, each able to produce offspring of the same kind. Okay, we see already God has a design for all of creation, all these living things, right? And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. 
And so we see this design throughout the animal kingdom, right? Male and female, including humans. Now, the special part about humans is that they have been created in the image of God. This is important. And you can see in creation that God has something special for these humans. They aren't just part of the livestock, right? That God has set them over top of his creation. And because he created them in his image, that's talk, that's royalty talk, right? So back in those days, the, the, the king or the, the person in charge was considered to be the very image of whatever God that the nation was serving. That was through all the nations. And this is what God, this is where it comes from. (laughs) It's because God himself created all human beings in the image of God. It's very special. And it's, it's why we're different. Because there's something different about the human than anything else in the entire universe. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. And so God, has, God gave the humans this, that, that charge, right? That command. Be fruitful. Multiply. Now, how is that going to be? Well, how is that going to happen? Sex. God created sex. So we find one of the first purposes, boom, right in the very first chapter of Genesis. There is no way to populate the earth at least in God's design, without sex. And so, oh, okay, be fruitful and multiply. So it's actually a command. Now let's fast forward into Genesis chapter 2. Then the Lord said, it is not good for man to be alone. I made lots of jokes about that one because I think it's funny (laughs) because it's still not good for men to be alone. (laughs) I will make a helper who is just right for him. Now, this is really important language. Again, what's being communicated in here is men and women have been created specifically in a design that God has in his master plan has created. So the Lord God formed the ground. Sorry. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. Interesting, because, you know, I I had trouble naming my kids, (laughs) let alone naming every animal on earth. This guy was super smart. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, all the wild animals, but still there was no no helper just right for him. I think there's a little humor in there, you guys, because, uh, I don't know, the image it evokes in me is is like, uh, nope, cow, I don't like that one. Nope, bird. Uh, <laughs> that one's weird. Whoa, elephant. Sorry. <laughs> right? It's just, there's this weird kind of like, what? He was actually looking to see if there's a helper among these animals? So what does God do? Okay, so this is just an, an, another, uh, this is a retelling in a different way of the first, first chapter. So God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's rib and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. Now, what's he going to (laughs) say? At last! Yeah, you guys are reading it. At last! (laughs) I looked at all those animals, and I was like, no way, God. (laughs) You've got to do something different. And uh, God brings to him this, this woman. At last! This one is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains, now this is interesting, because the writer, we think is Moses, jumps right to this. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. What? At last, this one is bone for my bone, flesh for my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. There's a marriage ceremony going on here, you guys. Adam, God is, there's a, there's, there's holding. He's putting them together. He's matching them up. Here, here you are. It's like a, this is, this is Adam and Eve's wedding. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. Now this is interesting because they were physically naked, 
But this is more than just physical nakedness. It means that they were completely known by each other and there was no shame. Emotionally, intellectually, physically, spiritually, there was not, nothing hidden. Everything was in the open, naked and unashamed. There was no shame. Sin had not entered the world yet, and so there was no shame. So this is how God designed this whole thing. Now, it's really important to note that, uh, and, and this is actually a misconception I've heard quite a bit, is that sex was a, came after man and woman sinned, that it was a result of the fall, right? That's actually some teaching in some Christian places. <laughs> it's totally not true. Uh, first of all, why would God tell them to multiply? <laughs> right? Right in the first chapter. And then why would he do this? Right? He didn't just go like, he didn't make them and then, you know, go on and do something else and turn around and be like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> right? This is <just> like, <laughs> right? Did, what? I didn't, you guys aren't supposed to do that. That's not what, that's not what God did. Right? He told them to multiply. And sex was one of the, was, well, not one of the ways. <laughs> sex was the, the, the catalyst for that, the, the way that that was going to happen. Now, there's more to it than that. We'll actually talk about the, uh, the purpose of sex in, in a little bit here. Okay, a biblical understanding of sex. So this is, this is where we want to go with this. I introduced this kind of already a little bit. Number one, sex is not dirty. The biblical view of sex is not one of filthy, dirty, something hidden, something to be hidden. That is not the, the fact. Not one place is the Bible negative about sex that is in God's design. Not one place. Now, outside of God's design, that's where the word perversion comes, by the way. If something is perverted, it's outside of the design. And so, well, we use that as a name as well. <laughs> it's just maybe not as good. Um, but that's where, that's where that, that all comes in. And so this common misconception is both in the church and in our, all, our culture. Just think of some of the, the songs out there, and I, I know this totally dates me, but, but one of the songs from ACDC is like, Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap. Like that's the name of a song, right? And so there's, and, and there's tons of songs. You guys can all, are probably all thinking of, some, of a song. <laughs> this is like, well, yeah. <laughs> Right? And it's just pushing this misconception that it's, it's dirty. And for um, the people who are pushing hard against God's design, don't want it. There's something like uh, intriguing and good about the dirty. Like it's like, oh, you want to be like that. Right? There's this push. But it's a misconception. And the same in the church. It's, uh, that misconception has, I, I think, harmed like un- generations of people. Because <laughs> we because of the refusal to talk about it. And th- yeah, I don't have time to go where I was going to go there, so I won't. Okay, so there's, so here's, but here's the other reason why sex is often considered dirty. Um, avoidance about talking about it. So you don't want to talk about it. Often things you don't want to talk about, no, don't want to talk about that. Don't, don't want to talk about that. There's like, oh, something wrong, something wrong with that, I guess. Like there's just, avoidance and silence is just not the way to go. Uh, abuse. Right, if you've if you've been an abuse victim or someone you love, or um, yeah, that is like, then you have this warped section of view of sex, and rightly so at the, because of that. Um, but God provides healing through that. Addiction, you know, addiction can also cause that. You know, pornography um, and other sex like sexual ad- addictions. Um, they can they can just make you feel dirty, and so you associate. Sex with being dirty. It's not true. It alters the view of God's pure view of sex or his design for it. Okay, so sex is, it's not dirty. That's a misconception. Secondly, sex is not God. Now, this is another one where, where our culture has latched on to, right? They worship it. Um, pornography is a, a, an example of like a temple, I guess you could say, to, to sexuality. But pornography is just one small, well, it's huge, but it's like one small sector of this. There's just, it, it is huge all over the world. It's not God. We don't worship it. One of the ways that w- we worship, you can see that people are like worshiping sex, is when your identity comes from your sexuality. Not sex as in gender, but 
your sexuality. You start defining yourself by your preferences. Oh, this is my identity. When you do that, that's an, actually an act of worship. But it's, sex is not God. We don't worship it. It isn't the purpose of life. And it's very compelling. There's, um, that's why there's so, much, so many ads on TV and the, like lots of them involve sexuality because there's this draw and lots and lots of people worship it. But as Christians, we don't worship it. We don't, that's not where I, our identity comes from. That's why we do a, that whole identity series before we do this series. Because in the end, we do not elevate sex above God and his design. Okay, so that's what it's not. Sex is not dirty. Sex is not God. So what is sex? Sex is a gift. We've already mentioned this a little bit, but sex is a gift. A biblical view of sex is that it is a gift from God for a man and a woman to enjoy in marriage. That's why God gave it. It is part of his good design. He gave us sexuality and sex as a gift. Now, I've used this analogy for many years, and so here's, here's what happens. When you use a gift the way, it's, it, way, the way it was um, intended to be used, it brings the gift giver joy. For instance, if I decide to give my son a baseball bat, it would give me great joy to, to, to go and see him play a, play a game of baseball, take his bat out, get up to the plate, and just crush one. I'd be like, yeah! Right? I'm like, yes! However, if my son decided to take that baseball bat to school and beat another kid with it? That would be horrifying. That's not what the bat's designed for. But can it be used to do that? Yes, of course it can. But that's not why they make bats. They make bats for baseball. Well, in the same way, in God's design, he's created sex for a specific, in his specific design, for a man and a woman in marriage. And when it's used outside of that, it becomes destructive. So one brings joy to the giver, like I gave my son a baseball bat and he's using it for baseball. Awesome. Even if he struck out, it'd be like, yeah, I used the bat. <laughs> Hit it next time. No. <laughs> so that's, I think that's a good example. It's kind of like, yeah, <laughs> if you gave somebody a bat and they beat somebody with it, that would suck. You'd feel a little bit responsible. Like, I don't think God feels that way. But as a dad, it'd be like, oh man, that was a mistake. And so that's why we need to view sex in God's design. It is a beautiful gift that God has given us. And so how is, what is it about this gift? So why did God create sex? Why did he give us this gift? There's, there's three reasons that I want to talk about today, and then we'll go to small group. Sex is a gift that God has given us. It's a good gift. The Bible says that every good gift comes from God. That's why it's exciting and hard to wait for. Right? Good gifts are exciting. And I remember as a kid, <laughs> coming to Christmas, I was the kid that would be, pick, pick, pick. <laughs> right? The, uh, all the gifts are under the tree. They're all wrapped. I'd be like, pick, pick. Ooh. Go away. Of course, as a kid, you think it's a really long time. No one will notice. <laughs> it's like five minutes. You come back, you're like, pick, pick, pick. A little bit more. <laughs> right? Until you've kind of discovered what it is. And then you realize, uh-oh. <laughs> uh, maybe somebody will notice. Is there like wrapping paper. It's just ripped right off, right? Um, but yeah, good gifts are hard to wait for. And when you're little, every gift's a good gift, right? You just, you just can't wait for Christmas. It's like, ah. There's no such thing as a bad gift when you're a little, little kid, right? It's they, your mom and dad could wrap a cardboard box and they'd be like, oh, what? This, this is awesome. I get to play in a cardboard box. <laughs> oh, to have that again. Uh, okay, enough of that nonsense. Three, why did God create sex? Three reasons. Number one, we've already talked about procreation. How in the world would Adam and Eve be able to go like, fill the world? <laughs> How do we do that? without sex. And so it just began with Adam and Eve, husband and wife, having sex, which produced babies, and so forth and so on. Fast forward, <laughs> here you are. 
that's where you came from too. If that's a revelation for you and you just realized how you got here, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. <laughs> Don't think of the song. All right, so procreation. That just, that's, that's why. In order to have babies, that's what we need to do. Uh, secondly, for unity and intimacy. So this is where the gift takes on a new shape. So in the animal king, kingdom, uh, it's procreation, right? In order for the animals to multiply, they have to have sex. Like that's procreation. That's, what, that's all they have. It's one-dimensional. But God has given us something that's multidimensional. And so secondly, we have this unity and intimacy. So this is how, this is how it's described in the Bible, that the two become one flesh. Now again, just like when they were naked and unashamed, it's not just talking about a physical act. So God has given us this amazing gift, and it's not just physical. It, it is physical, but that's not it. It's physical, it's spiritual, it's emotional. Um, it's the, whole, the whole, whole thing. This one flesh involves your entire person. And we're actually going to have some, some stuff in later talks that, that kind of fleshes that out. Okay, God didn't have to do that. He didn't have to make sex with intimacy. It could have just been like, okay, procreate, that's all you have to do, just obey me. But he didn't. Unity and intimacy is a, is a result from, from sex between a man and woman in their marriage. And then thirdly, pleasure. God did not have to make sex pleasurable, you guys. Again, to counteract some of the like craziness that's out there about teaching about sex. God did not have to make it pleasurable. There's parts of the human body that are, that they only have one function for pleasure. God did that. He designed it that way. And when it's used in his design, it actually brings glory to God. So a man and his wife, having sex is something that glorifies God. I don't know if you've ever heard that before, but you did now. Because God's gift of sex is a good gift. And all, the, all, the, all his gifts are good. All right. God desires us to honor him with our minds, bodies, our whole being. Everything. Soul, mind, body, spirit, any, any, every part. And the, if the soul is the whole part, then yeah, let's go with that. He wants us to honor him. Every part. We honor him by using his gifts in his design, think of the baseball analogy. We honor him by using his gifts in his design for his glory and for our benefit and joy. Because when we use his gifts the way he's designed them, it benefits us and gives us joy. That's the vision that God has for sex. And I know it's pushed hard against from our culture. Uh, but that's, again, that's why we're doing this. We want to get a biblical understanding of sex. All right, so what do we need to walk away with today? It's sex is not God. We don't, we don't worship it. It's not why we, why we live. It's not our purpose. It's a gift, right? No, oh, sorry. I gave it away now. Sex is not dirty, right? It can become dirty in its perversion when it's outside of God's, but the, the dirty is the sinful part, right? Dirty is, the, I don't like the word. It becomes sin when it's outside of God's design. Finally, sex it is a gift from God. We need to have this thinking of it. It's not embarrassing. It's, it's God has designed you the way you are with those desires, with, with, uh, with the body that you have. Because of his creation, he created you in his image. He has a design for, for men and women. And when we buy into that design, it's good. And we'll, we'll flesh this out later, and there's lots of misconceptions that we can talk about, and we will talk about some of those later. Uh, but that's what we got today. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, this is one of those things that I think is super important, and throughout, I hope we'll start answering maybe some of those questions you might have. And we are open to answering any questions that you have. All right, let me pray. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you so much that you have a great design, and that it is actually beneficial that humans flourish when we're um, in your design. And it hurts us. And it hurts our cultures and societies and, and countries. And it hurts people when it's outside of your design. And so, Lord, uh, I pray throughout this series, you've given us, give us a vision of what you have for us 
as far as sex goes. Lord, we want to understand it. We want to see it the way you see it. We understand it the way that you've given it to us. Um, And we want this biblical understanding to guide us through all of the craziness that's all around us. So Lord, I pray for good discussions, good times in our uh, small groups as we go, and blessing on all these amazing teenagers. Just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.